Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this Jan Accommodation and Compliance Series webcast, What You Should Know About the Impact of Long COVID in the Workplace, a collaborative presentation including representatives from Dis the Disability Management Employer Coalition, Sedgwick, the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, and the Job Accommodation Network. My name is Tracy DeFrutis. I'm the Director of Training, Services, and Outreach for Jan. The COVID-19 pandemic has resu resulted in millions of people now experiencing chronic health conditions related to their initial COVID infection, known as long COVID. According to the Centers for Disease Control, long COVID includes a wide range of ongoing health issues that last for several months or longer. Symptoms affect people in various ways and can impact performing daily activities and working. Today's training is designed to share information about the impact of long COVID in the workplace. And I'd like to introduce our speakers. Terry Rhodes, Chief Executive Officer for the Disability Management Employer Coalition. Brian Bass, Senior Vice President in Workforce Absence and Disability Practice Leader for Sedgwick. And Suzanne Briere, Co-Director and Co-Principal Director for the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion. I'll also join the conversation later in the webcast. Thank you all for collaborating with Jan for this webcast and for sharing all this important information today. We really appreciate you. Let's get started first with some necessary housekeeping items. Uh, to address any technical difficulties you're having during the webcast, please use the question and answer option located at the bottom of your screen to connect with our tech team. We offer an FAQ that might answer some of your questions. Uh, see the login email you received today for the FAQ link. You can also find it at the askjan.org website uh, via the webcast registration page. The live chat on the askjan.org homepage is also another option if you're having some difficulty or call 800-526-7234. Questions for presenters should be submitted using the Q&A option, not the chat, and all questions will be gathered into a queue and, time permitting, will be answered at the end of the webcast. A PowerPoint is available for this webcast. Attendees must download the PowerPoint slides using the direct link found in the login email you received today. The link is also posted in the chat now and can be found at this webcast event page via the training tab at askjan.org. To access live captioning, use the closed caption option at the bottom of the webcast window or view captions in a separate browser using the link shared in the webcast chat. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the askjan.org website and the Jan YouTube page as well. And finally, at the end of the webcast, we'd like to know your feedback, so please do complete the evaluation. If you're seeking a CEU, the approval code will be provided after the webcast evaluation is completed. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover today. We'll begin by learning about the findings of the collaborative DMEC Long COVID Think Tank, then EARN's Long COVID Roundtable and Resources, and to wrap up, we'll share some accommodation process tips. Uh, time permitting, we'll also talk about some accommodation solutions. Now I'm going to turn the discussion over to Terry Rhodes and Brian Bass. Terry, you're up. Thank you, Tracy. We're excited to be able to present the findings from the think tank and uh, Brian and I will be presenting this information together. So last spring, when we were coming out of the throes of the pandemic, we kept hearing about people who were called long haulers or who had long COVID. And there was great concern that was expressed by the general public, as well as those of us in the absence and disability uh, industry, about how this might impact our workforce. And this was particularly concerning because we had the great resignation that was occurring kind of simultaneous, simultaneously. It was estimated, and this was about a year and a half ago, that there were 23 million people who were suffering from long COVID. That's like one in 13 uh, individuals. And employers needed practical solutions for assisting employees in staying at work with accommodations or returning to work following a leave of absence. 
So this think tank was formed to try and find specific solutions for individuals who were suffering from long COVID and needed some help staying at work or getting back to work. We had 18 participants, very, very smart people in this business. Their names and companies are in the white paper. And um, the uh, white paper is available. We did publish it in January. It's available to all of you. Um, and it's also on the JAN website, and I believe it's on the DMEC website. So, you know, please access it. There's a lot of good information in there that came from the think tank. And so as we start looking at these costs and, you know, we don't have a full picture, we're still, we're still gathering information. We looked at a couple of studies. One was by Nomi Health and they're a direct health care company. They analyzed about 20 million uh, long COVID claims, COVID claims and uh, diabetes claims. And they found that the long COVID claims were about 26% higher than even their diabetic claims. And then we also looked at some information that was submitted by Sedgwick on their work, specific to their workers' compensation book of business in the US. And they found that the long COVID claims compared to the COVID claims were about 12% higher. So we're beginning to see the cost, the impact of long COVID. And as the fear of recession looms, we have to think about what's going to happen to the individuals who have long COVID who need help getting back to work and what are the tools that employers need to help get them back to work. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Terry, for that introduction. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, when we got together in, in, as a collective um, and really started to dig into um, long COVID, if we go to the next slide, that would be great. <clears throat> Uh, one of the things that became apparent to us in, in, in all of our conversation, regardless of where we are coming from in terms of providing the health care uh, in the system itself, or those that are in the industry as insurers or third party administrators, providing uh, benefit coverage or attempting to provide benefit coverage for individuals who are suffering from COVID or long COVID, was that we were seeing some significant inadequacies in not only the healthcare system, but also the disability uh, system overall. And what we're hearing is that those individuals that were presenting with the types of symptoms associated with long COVID, such as fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive challenges, they were receiving services such as physical, respiratory, or occupational therapy. However, many of the health plans were restricting and continue to restrict some of these therapies uh, to a defined number of visits or would only cover therapy services as long as the patients uh, continue to improve. And I think what we all know now and we're continuing to see is that long COVID is proving to be uh, a condition that is taking a long amount of time to actually diagnose. In fact, um, healthcare providers are ruling out all other types of conditions first before they get to a, a point where they may be making a long COVID diagnosis. And in many cases, that long COVID diagnosis may come four to six months after an individual start, uh, is treating for those symptoms outside of the acute phase of COVID. Additionally, when we look at the disability system from a Social Security Administration perspective, um, again, this information is from last year, but Kaiser Health News reported that there were about 40,000 disability claims that included an indication of COVID infection at some point. What we don't know is how many of those claims are among the more than 1 million uh, Social Security disability applications that are awaiting processing. Um, what we do know is that um, partial disability is not something that is commonly uh, covered. Uh, under disability plans or even from the Social Security uh, Disability Administration. And we know that that is an, a common characteristic of long COVID where an individual may not be fully disabled, but they may have partial disabilities um, that prevent them from performing major life functions or, or even working. And then we also know that there are caps with respect to uh, someone in the amount of benefits that they can draw and what they can earn in the market. Um, and that might prevent employees from working if and when they can. Turn it back over to Terry. Great, we can go to the next slide, Tracy. So as we 
as Brian was talking about some of the brain fog issues and um, other cognitive issues that that um, are prevalent in long COVID, uh, we see an exacerbation of our already overwhelmed medical health system, mental, excuse me, mental health system. And to set the stage, so pre-pandemic, the general prevalence of depression in the workplace was about 24%. So about a quarter of the population has had some kind of depression, 15% for PTSD. However, when we add in individuals that have had a COVID, have had a COVID infection, that increased to 42%. And then those individuals with symptoms of PTSD went way up to 96%. And here's some things to think about as we move through the mental health issues associated with individuals who have long COVID. As Brian said, our disability system isn't really set up to handle the long COVID um, individuals. Many long-term disability plans, policies have a 24 month limit on mental health benefits, which may not be adequate for individuals with long COVID. And if you were a previously healthy individual and you now have long haulers or long COVID, you may be experiencing symptoms of difficulty focusing, concentrating, thinking, and then you come to work and you're trying to do your job and this increases your anxiety, your stress, depression, and even trauma as a result of not being able to perform your, your job as you once did. Additionally, this is compounded by other cognitive and emotional challenges that people with long COVID experience because these symptoms come and go. They wax and wane. They may have a good day. They may have a bad day. They may have a good week. They may have a bad week. And so they cannot, these individuals cannot predict how they will perform at any given time. So that's a problem for the employees. Well, now we move that on to the employer side and we see that this is probably going to result in some kind of intermittent leave. And while intermittent leave is not difficult to manage, what is difficult to manage is your staffing in your workforce and how does this impact how you will staff on any given day the last thing to think about is generally speaking and this is absent the long COVID the chances of individuals having a successful return to work diminish the longer that they're off work so for example we know that an individual who's been off work about six months has about a 55% success rate of actually getting back to work and staying at work. Well, we move that down the spectrum to two years and it's less than 5% success. So these are things to think about. Uh, Brian, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. All right, thanks, Terry. So as we pointed out, um, you know there are a significant number of disparities um, in the system today. And so as a result, it's really requiring employers to adapt and think differently um, in being more creative in the solutions that are being provided. So we do know that these challenges um, are gonna require or have required organizations to focus on an organization-wide education and a new mindset about disabilities in general. And the purpose of today's session is to provide you with some ideas on some solutions that as an employer you can put in place to help accommodate these challenges as they, as they continue to present themselves. One of the things that we note is with long COVID in particular, fatigue is one of the most commonly reported symptoms followed by post-exertion malaise and brain fog. So those are the three most commonly reported uh, symptoms. What we know traditionally from an overall accommodation perspective or in accommodating them in the work environment is that these symptoms are sometimes often the most challenging for pin, uh, employers to pinpoint and to accommodate. So creative solutions that we're gonna talk about today such as flexible scheduling and organizational applications and software, job coaches and more all need to be considered in accommodation strategies that are put in place. 
We also know that employers that are able to fall back on their formal, a formal return to work programs that they may already have in place are more likely to be able to quickly and effectively address accommodation needs for employees with long COVID. Uh, with long COVID. Unfortunately, there are a significant number of employers that don't have formal programs in place. And we do know that in those instances, there's a risk for a knowledge drain in their organizations, because if they're not able to accommodate individuals, then those individuals are not gonna be able to work. Um, and therefore they may, may not, they may get out of the workforce uh, completely. Um, the other thing to consider is that we are seeing an increasing number of uh, reports or complaints to the EEOC reporting that their employer has failed to accommodate long COVID limitations. So looking back uh, into 2021's data, we don't have 2022's data uh, yet from the EEOC, but to give you an idea of this, there were six, over 6,000 COVID related charges of discrimination 66% of those COVID-related charges were raising ADA violations for a total of over 4,000. And those are just complaints that are coming in. So that gives you an idea of the scope and magnitude of, of what we have uh, in front of us and what we need to be thinking about as employers. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk about some recommendations, and I think in general, our advice is employers should be prepared for the ongoing increase in job accommodation requests related to long COVID. And you need to know, if you don't already, that in 2021, uh, long COVID was formally recognized as a disability under the ADA. So you need to treat these just like any other accommodation request. I'm not really going to go into the reasonable accommodations because Tracy and Suzanne are going to talk about that in more detail. But just in general, there are many ways that an individual can be accommodated. And remember that a long COVID claim is just like any other accommodation request and that you start with the interactive process. And um, go from there. Next thing to think about is educating your employees. It's really important that you provide mental and wellness information to your employees. Secondly, enhance the access to care. Make sure you understand what's covered under your health plan. Have you taken a look at your EAP program? Does it need some refreshing? And make sure that you understand and employees understand what all of your benefit offerings are. And then the last one, and certainly this has been an ongoing effort by many employers over the years, is to eliminate stigma. And, you know, this is important and it should be just part of the ongoing strategy that companies employ um, today. So, Brian, I think you're going to summarize things for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in summary, um, I'm not going to go through each of these bullet points uh, due to the amount of time that we have remaining. And I'm, we really want to get into these solutions. And these are also available to you in the white paper. So I think it's important for us to close at this point with respect to the, the white paper and that this really was the first comprehensive examination of how organizations are accommodating employees with long COVID. And the white paper does outline for employers, what you can do to improve results for employees and your organization, and how to better prepare for the viruses, mental health, and behavioral health challenges, and other developments that will require effective employee accommodations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tracy. I think we're going to have Suzanne jump in here next then. Thank oh, you, sorry, Terry sorry. and Brian. No problem. Thank you, um, Terry and Brian, for that terrific overview of a very useful summary of things that are occurring um, and, and that you were able to gather information from. I am going to take some time with you now. Uh, and I think one of the wonderful things about today's webinar is you will see concurrence across many of these things that suggest what's needed, what the issues are, and also some, some suggestions of, of the next way to go. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I am uh, going to talk about a roundtable that was uh, two, uh, two overarching things, a roundtable that was uh, hosted at the Disability Management Employers Coalition Conference last summer um, that was uh, facilitated by the Employer Assistance Resource Network, specifically Assistant Secretary Taryn Williams and Lou Orsleen. Uh, were able to facilitate at, at the uh, hosting of DMEC, a roundtable. And I'm, and I'm also going to talk about a resource that we have uh, on the EARN and the JAN websites that I think does a good summary of many of the things that you're hearing today. Before I do that, I want to set the backdrop just a bit to talk about some work that has been done to inform our team at the Employer Assistance Resource Network about what's going on. Um, Around long COVID, we did a both a uh, literature review and we did some interviews with members of the employer, the Employee Assistance Professionals Association, which along with DMEC are two of 13 organizations which are part of the leadership council of the Employer Assistance Resource Network. And we found from the literature review uh, that um, there were uh, a, a number of things that popped out. We asked four predominant questions as we went through over 800 different items that we identified in an extensive literature review. Uh, we, we narrowed that down to items that just answered qu these four questions. What are employer and, and employee experiences with long COVID at work? What are employer and employee experiences um, what kinds of reasonable accommodations for long COVID have been requested in employment settings? And what guidance does this literature provide for supporting employers and supervisors in managing employees with long COVID? Next slide, please. So in terms of the experiences of employees, our first question, some of the things we found is that um, there was a significant impact on the symptoms as you as you heard from Terry and Brian, um, and and um, you know it had to do with brain fog. It had to do with uh, increased fatigue. It had to do with um, unable to sit or stand for long periods of time. But also, what came out in the literature is a disproportionality for uh, certain populations, um, specifically middle-aged women and people of color, seem to be more disproportionately impacted. We had similar such findings in terms of the symptoms that were being reported by EAP professionals, but also the disproportionality when we spoke to these members of organizations that they were supporting, they talked uh, about, again, this disproportionality was significant. In terms of uh, um, it, it, part of that, let me also just add before I move on to the reasonable accommodations, was also where this was showing up in, in different types of jobs because many blue collar individuals reported less flexibility in, in being able to work remotely and, and many were people of, of color in these jobs. And our, uh, and our question about reasonable accommodation, uh, you are hearing certainly some of these things from Terry and Brian um, as well. One of the things that has been, I think, encouraging that has come out of the pandemic is that what is considered reasonable has changed over time. We've learned a lot from the pandemic. Working from home has become much more socially and professionally acceptable for people with and without disabilities during the pandemic. And remote work has been noted as a beneficial accommodation for people with long COVID as well as for people with disabilities who perhaps historically before the pandemic were uh, more likely to offer it, but not always get accommodations for remote work. There was also noted in the literature some alternatives not commonly used that became more common, such as phased work returns, uh, fatigue management strategies, support groups or buddy systems to support people around these mental health considerations as well as, of course, the more common modifications such as workplace policies and job restructurings, which we have often seen in the past. Um, okay, next slide, please. Uh, and in terms of managing employees with long COVID, um, 
uh, we we understand and apply. The, you know, you heard this from Brian and Terry. Really important to stay on top of regulatory requirements and understand how they apply in this situation. ADA and FMLA, of course, being most important, um, and understanding how to navigate that in uh, in a realistic way, but also in a in a responsible way, and the importance of communication in that, offering guidance for employees. Uh, with long COVID as they navigate time away from work, as well as information on the manager's role during this time period, um, and the importance of managers staying in touch with employees in a supportive way. Um, in terms of supporting employees with long COVID that, that came out from the literature, it uh, again, it needs to very consistent with what uh, was we found, for, we heard from our DMEC and Sedgwick colleagues, it needs to be a multidisciplinary approach. It needs to include management, HR specialists, health and safety specialists, clinicians, medical providers, voc rehab counselors, and we need to be educating uh, employers about what the symptoms are and how to manage that and support employees um, in, around productivity and affording them some flexibility. That takes some education. So moving on to uh, our round table. And the results, I think you're going to see them very consistent. We had approximately 24 participants uh, at the DMEC conference that attended this 90-minute session that was led by uh, Assistant Secretary Taryn Williams and Laura Sleen. And uh, they provided feedback on workplace concerns and response to those concerns of these members that were employers and also vendors of services supporting employers in these issues. So the next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, vendor concerns, we saw increasing number, vendors told us increasing number of employees with symptoms of long COVID, such as cognitive limitations and fatigue, and it was certainly impacting work productivity and their health care costs. Healthcare costs. Um, they also articulated difficulties in diagnosing employees. The definitions uh, were often seen as confusing. And um, it was difficult for service providers to provide a definite diagnosis of employees with long COVID and, and to inform that support's needed. Um, so the, the, uh, the suggestion was to provide more support needed to manage productivity as there's a lack of understanding. And, and um, issues also coming up uh, that we, we've experienced certainly with disability, especially non-obvious disabilities in the past, but people's reluctance to say that both they had uh, they had been diagnosed with long COVID or were experiencing the symptoms, even if they hadn't had a firm diagno diagnosis, or that they were experiencing the stress from that and the pandemic more broadly. So a reluctance to come forward and get the supports that they needed um, so again, importance in, in educating both employees about the importance of coming forward, but also supervisors to encourage that support. We also heard similarly to what you heard from Terry and Brian that um, organizations need more guidance, uh, <clears throat> especially around changing insurance benefits and policies to support employees with long COVID. And they're they're also at the same time knowing that they need to do that, concerned about precedent setting and the costs and implications of these changes. Medical and mental health care professional shortages were uh, often the topic of discussion from several different people and um, the impediments and payers policies, again, similarly to what you heard, were precluding getting necessary uh, length of care and also interdisciplinary care, um, which was required. It was, it was sounding from our vendors and our employers across a number of different uh, specialists needed to support individuals in, in getting diagnosis and the interventions that they needed. And um, next slide, employer vendor response to these concerns. Uh, e EAP care continuum, critically important. Aggregating mental health data and sharing that, um, our, our uh, attendees thought it was really critically important that they understand what people were experiencing so they knew what kind of interventions to design and, and how to change their policies and providing those, getting that aggregate data being very important. Having a logical continuum of support 
um, that they could point to across different uh, specialists needed and, and extensions of care around EAP. Getting some guidance on standard standards of care from CDC and knowing uh, how that played out across different types of disciplinary protocols and getting a better understanding of, of the limitations of long COVID across the, the different ways it's manifesting and the kinds of support um, that they could more universally apply and be more ready to respond. They also noted the differences between large and small employers and the challenges and solutions that they were able to implement. And uh, we need to be thinking about how to provide them with this guidance as well. And improving public knowledge of community resources. They, uh, they certainly flagged for us that there is not a common knowledge uh, about for individuals about what to do or, or employers to know how to respond. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I wanna quickly turn and, and provide, point you toward an online resource that you have readily available to you that was produced by the Employer Assistance Resource Network and the Job Accommodation Networks team. It's available from both of our websites and includes a variety of information such as statistics, uh, uh, identifies the common conditions that you've heard about, what symptoms that you can look for as employers, and um, uh, next slide, please. I'm going to go quickly through these so we can uh, get on to, thank you, um, <clears throat> how it's uh, contributing and how it's contributing to a current national labor shortage and how we should, again, this points to the importance of using some of these uh, good uh, approaches that we've been able to get from employers who are responding proactively to keep our existing workforce in place and bring people back to work in a timely way. Um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Accenture has predicted this labor shortage and we expect it to continue uh, and because of the need for, for labor and competition is intense right now, as many of you who are in attendance here today, I'm sure know, it is going to be really important um, that we are proactive in accommodating people, keeping them in the workforce. Next slide, please. So uh, in our brochure, in this informational brochure, we also talk about, it's, there's a extensive Q&A, you can tap um, from that, but some of the things that come out of that, how employers can support and retain employees with long COVID by providing effective accommodations, and Tracy's going to give you some examples of that, the benefits of doing so beyond just fulfilling your legal obligations, and the importance of doing that in the interactive manner that the ADA requires, really talking with employees, understanding what they're experiencing, and how that is an impediment in their effective functioning in their current job. And of course, this comes out repeatedly in everything each of us is saying, the importance of workplace flexibility, such as telework and flexible scheduling, and that that will contribute to retention of individuals. So that was a very quick uh, overview of several different segments of information that we are recruiting at the Employer Assistance Resource Network. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy to talk about accommodations. Thank you, Suzanne. That was great. Uh, we learned so much from you and from Terry and from Brian already. Um, but we're going to expand a little bit on the importance of providing accommodations for individuals with long COVID by learning about some accommodation process tips from Jan and then time permitting, of course, we'll talk about accommodation solutions as well. So we've heard about various insights and challenges today. Uh, addressing long COVID's accommodation process challenges does require an organization-wide education and a new mindset about disabilities in general, I would say. Um, our first response to an employee who presents with long COVID symptoms, it really should be, what can we do to help keep you working? Um, that's where that accommodation process begins. Uh, there should be a collaborative effort to explore reasonable accommodation solutions that enables employees with long COVID to stay in the workforce, uh, which benefits not just the individual, but also the employer and our economy as a whole. So, you know, we've heard about, you know, what's happening as a result of the impact of long COVID overall. 
Some of the challenges can be addressed by engaging in practical strategies that go beyond ADA compliance. And I'll talk about some of these strategies in a moment. But the accommodation process challenges can include things like, um, you know, we've heard a little bit about stigma. So individuals with long COVID feeling discouraged about disclosing their medical condition due to that stigma. There may be some social stigma, which stems from fear and uncertainty about COVID and long COVID. Uh, but disability disclosure, providing information about a medical condition and someone's functional limitations, prompting that need for accommodation, it's necessary in order to receive accommodations under the ADA. Also, if you, as you've heard, uh, a lack of consistency in how long COVID is defined and diagnosed is a challenge that can directly impact whether accommodations are provided. So because there's no test to diagnose long COVID and people may have a wide variety of symptoms that could come from other medical conditions as well. Also, while most people with long COVID have evidence of infection or COVID-19 illness, in some cases, a person with post-COVID conditions may not have tested positive for the virus or ever known they were infected. So this can make it difficult for healthcare providers to recognize and diagnose long COVID. So this has really become a challenge. Another challenge is, is a lack of employer understanding of ADA requirements and how to support workers with long COVID. Uh, employers are still learning, much like all of us, they're, they're still learning about the effects of long COVID, uh, whether the ADA applies and the responsibility to provide accommodations. So as it relates to ADA compliance, um, there is that question of whether long COVID is an ADA disability. And as Terry mentioned, uh, you know, it has been recognized by federal agencies who have weighed in on this. But given the ADA's directive to construe disability broadly, employers really should just always err on the side of finding coverage when debatable. So basically what we're saying here is don't get bogged down in determining disability, rather focus on whether a reasonable accommodation can be provided. This is guidance that Jan generally offers on determining disability and figuring out whether to engage in that process. But it's really especially true for those with long COVID. Because long COVID is a relatively new condition, some employees may find it challenging to obtain a definitive diagnosis and get that documentation. Um, however, keep in mind, a diagnosis may not be necessary to move forward with requesting or providing accommodations. Uh, if Even if an employee doesn't have an official diagnosis, the healthcare provider uh, should be able to document that the employee has an impairment or how the impairment affects the employee in performing daily life activities. So it's really going to come down to what in that instance is known about the medical situation that that person is, is dealing with and what they're learning about it. So I'd say lean in on understanding the individual's limitations, uh, the impact of those limitations on working, and whether reasonable and effective accommodations will enable that person to perform the essential duties of the job and meet the performance requirements. Also, again, beyond compliance, remember that employers are free to provide accommodations, adjustments, if you will, if someone doesn't meet the ADA definition of disability. And for as many people as we know might uh, be in the workforce and, and dealing with symptoms and limitations around long COVID, it makes sense to make modifications to keep people working. So for more information around whether, uh, you know, long COVID is a disability and looking at how the laws apply, uh, that's the ADA, the Rehab Act, and other EEO laws, uh, the EEOC has an excellent resource that what you should know about COVID-19, the ADA, the Rehab Act, and other EEO laws. Uh, Jan also has a resource that specifically addresses long COVID and the ADA. So those resources are available uh, to, uh, to learn a little bit more about that. Now we know that when the medical condition or need for accommodation isn't known or obvious, employers may require reasonable medical information. But again, medical proof of long COVID, it can be a barrier. Individuals may be asked to provide information that might show they have a medical condition uh, or are working toward a diagnosis and, and that essentially there's an impairment that substantially limits at least one major life activity. But a diagnosis may not be necessary to move forward with providing an accommodation or moving through that process. So the accommodation 
uh, process tip to remember here is that employers are encouraged to focus on the limitations caused by long COVID and why an accommodation is needed uh, without asking for medical proof of the specific condition as a prerequisite for providing accommodation. So it's just, it's something to consider. Uh, showing why an accommodation is needed usually means verifying what limitations are creating a problem, how the limitations are, are interfering or affecting job performance. So it's really figuring out what's the person uh, experiencing, what are their symptoms, how is this affecting their ability to do the job. So consider what I'd call the what, so the work-related issues, what the person's having difficulty doing, and then also the why, so what's the cause or what are the symptoms or limitations affecting work the how, so the accommodation solutions to address the work-related issues. As it relates to long COVID, common work-related barriers um, might include uh, difficulty meeting attendance requirements, difficulty working without frequent breaks, trouble sitting or standing for long periods of time, uh, difficulty completing executive functions like concentrating, remembering, multitasking, planning or organizing, it could also be physical limitations, such as moving around the work environment or lifting. Uh, it can also be difficulty speaking. These are just some common, not a comprehensive list, um, but there's th some things to keep in mind. Common symptoms and limitations resulting from long COVID. We've heard a little bit about this already, uh, but it could be difficulty breathing, uh, fatigue, difficulty thinking or concentrating, sometimes called that brain fog. Uh, of course, anxiety and depression is reported, uh, as well as some other uh, common symptoms and limitations. But again, keep in mind, this is, these are not a comprehensive list of limitations or difficulty performing job duties, just some that, that we tend to be hearing about at JAN. Taking all of this into consideration, one of the most important accommodation process tips is don't use a one-size-fits-all approach. So you wanna keep in mind that impairments and limitations, as well as accommodation needs, they're different based on the individual. So make sure you're treating each person on a case-by-case -case basis. You wanna cultivate a culture of accommodation within the workforce, train managers, HR leadership to support the workforce and retain qualified workers by providing effective accommodation solutions. You know, we say it all the time, have the full accommodation conversation with the employee. Talk with that individual. Learn about their unique situation. You want to make individualized assessments based on the limitations, the impairment that's involved, uh, the essential job duties that need to be performed. So don't generalize based on assumptions about the medical condition, or about what we think someone with long COVID is going through. Also be aware of making any assumptions about what an individual can or cannot do or what accommodation is needed. So again, it comes back to having that full conversation with the individual to understand their unique circumstances. And frankly, this is good advice for all accommodation situations. The next accommodation process tip is especially important to address the needs of individuals with long COVID. So providing temporary and trial accommodations. Uh, trial, short-term solutions, uh, these support employee retention. Um, circumstances can change. And sympt symptoms might fluctuate. They might improve. Uh, the new symptoms might develop over time as well. So we really want to keep that in mind. Uh, and that can be, uh, you know, by providing temporary solutions, we can kind of adjust and, and figure things out along the way. Also, providing accommodations on a trial or a temporary basis can help us figure out whether accommodations are effective. Uh, maybe we're not really sure how things are going to go. So if we give it a, a short period of time to kind of test things out, that's okay. We can figure that out and maybe make some adjustments if we find that the accommodation isn't effective. Uh, it can also enable somebody to return to work sooner than anticipated. So sometimes we make temporary accommodations that might go beyond what an employer might ordinarily be expected to do. Uh, and for that reason, we, we provide them on a temporary basis, but it's a way to get people back to work sooner than anticipated. Um, they can also show good faith on the part of the employer. So to keep employees working uh, they, by making those modifications, uh, you could expedite return to work after illness as well. So it's just it's a it's something we talk about at Jan all the time. Um, but uh, but you really want to consider those temporary or trial accommodations, and we offer some more information on that as well. 
The last accommodation process tip I'll share is view telework through a different lens. Uh, telework sure enabled businesses to keep operating during the pandemic, but now many employers are returning people to the work site. As a result, we're kind of back to viewing it as a form of accommodation when necess necessitated by a disability. Uh, telework has always been a form of accommodation under the ADA. Uh, though in the past, not often the preferred solution by employers, but we need to view telework more favorably now that it's had a trial run in the mainstream. So for those with varied limitations from long COVID, this can be a common and effective accommodation solution when it's reasonable. Uh, if the employer already, I'm sorry, if the employee Sorry, if the employer already allows telework, um, then it's probably not an accommodation. So if as a matter of policy or practice or benefit, the employer allows telework, you're not gonna treat it as an accommodation situation just because someone asked because of a disability or a medical reason. Uh, however, if someone's asking for something beyond the current telework policy, that's when it becomes an accommodation situation. So you might need to gather some more information, process the request, uh, and review it uh, as an accommodation. Of course, whether it's reasonable will depend on uh, whether that person can perform the essential job duties at home and to what extent. I, I do tell a lot of employers kind of keep in mind that it's not always an at all or nothing. Maybe it's a hybrid situation. Uh, there might be some middle ground solution if truly all of the essential functions can't be performed 100% from home. So I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind. I could talk about telework at length, for, but for the sake of time, I'm going to encourage you to go to askjan.org for more information. Look at the A to Z section under the topic of telework. One of the tools that we offer is a resource called uh, the Telework Accommodation Request Tool. It kind of helps you work, walk through those telework accommodation requests and figure out maybe what's the best way to approach those. So we do have some time, so I will go ahead and talk a little bit about accommodation solutions. Uh, for those of you who know Jan, that's what we're all about. We're here to offer you some practical ideas, resources around accommodations. Some people with long COVID who have kept working, um, you know, are, are going to maybe need some accommodations. Uh, so we've heard a little bit about flexible work arrangements, transitional work uh, responsibilities. You know, some people with long COVID who have kept working have had to reduce their, their weekly working hours by as many as 10 on average, according to some studies. Uh, for this reason, exploring transitional and modified work arrangements, it might be very helpful. Uh, and that can include things like uh, transitioning back to full-time work over a short period of time. Uh, it could be requesting modified or light duty as a temporary solution. Uh, maybe, you know, basically getting the work done whenever it's happening, depending on your business and, and how people perform their job duties. It could happen anywhere at any time, as long as it gets done. Uh, that could also be flexible scheduling, so flexi time, a compressed work week, or part-time. And alternative scheduling, different types of shifts that might be better, staggered schedules, uh, and of course, I already mentioned hybrid work and, and telework. So flexible work arrangements are, are really critical, I think, in, in these types of situations. A common limitation we've heard related to lung COVID is, of course, brain fog. We've, we've heard that from everyone today, uh, which it can result in difficulty concentrating and difficulty with memory deficits. Jen offers some great information to address these types of limitations, uh, which fall into that category of executive functioning deficits. Uh, so, for example, some accommodations could include uh, reducing distractions in the work area, uh, providing enclosures or private space to work in or telework as a solution to move out of that work site. Uh, it could be using it in environmental sound machines, earbuds, or a headset of some kind to kind of reduce the, the environmental sounds that can be problematic, reducing clutter in the work environment. Uh, something I think can be helpful is planning for uninterrupted work time, you know, if it's possible to not to only have to tend to and focus on one specific task and not to be uh, interrupted by emails and phone calls, things like that. So planning that time. It could also be dividing uh, large assignments into smaller tasks and steps so that they're more manageable. 
So there can be lots of ways to address concentration. Um, one of my favorite resources that Jan offers is our accommodation solutions for individuals with executive functioning deficits. Some really great accommodation ideas in that resource, uh, including these and many others, uh, including some also like those on the next slide related to memory deficits. Uh, so if, if someone's having difficulty with memory, it might be looking at providing written instructions and checklists that can help them uh, process information, stay on task, remember it. Using a voice recorder can be very helpful if, if we know that there are either conversations or certain tasks that need to take place and the person might have difficulty remembering what that is. Uh, using a voice recorder, uh, maybe to take meeting minutes, that, that comes up quite a bit. Uh, allowing additional time for, for training on new tasks. It could be things like a flowchart to indicate steps in a task. So maybe we just can't seem to remember that there are five different steps that have to happen in a certain order. A simple flowchart can really just resolve that very easily. Uh, it could be also notebooks, planners, or sticky notes to uh, record information as reminders of dates or tasks. And um, those could be used in a variety of, of, of ways. We've also heard a lot about the mental health component here. And um, so certainly, uh, you know, that, that, that is coming along with the long COVID uh, condition as well. And so depression and anxiety, they're commonly reported at Jan. Our mental health related caseload has risen tremendously for various reasons related to the pandemic, but including related to long COVID. Some accommodations to explore to address anxiety uh, might include uh, identifying and reducing triggers, uh, allowing a flexible schedule, modified breaks so the person has, has time to take breaks as needed. It could be contacting a support person when anxiety is triggered as well. Uh, maybe having a rest area or space that person can go take a break and um, perhaps uh, rest for a little while that's private or allowing access for an emotional support animal or a support person or job coach could also be very helpful. Of course, motor and mobility related limitations can also be significant, uh, resulting in fatigue, difficulty standing, sitting for long periods of time, um, also lifting related limitations. Uh, accommodation solutions, of course, will vary based on the specific job duties involved, but to address things like fatigue and difficulty standing or sitting, it could be allowing periodic rest breaks, uh, allowing reduced or flexible work schedule. It could be uh, allowing time for sitting if the job does require a lot of standing, and that might mean providing some form of stool for that person to be able to sit back on. Uh, that might be a stand lean stool, for example. It could be breaks to change position. We hear a lot about requests for adjustable workstations so that the person can alternate between sitting and standing. There are ways to address fatigue from standing as well. So anti-fatigue matting at the workstation or wearable anti-fatigue matting shoes that actually have that as an option. Uh, and of course, job restructuring and telework can come into play in these types of situations as well. Uh, with, uh, with difficulty lifting, it could be reallocating lifting duties if they're marginal. Uh, so if it's really not something the person has to be responsible for, maybe look to having someone else perform that duty. Uh, it could be placing frequently used tools and, and supplies near or at the waist level to kind of take out the need to lift. When we think about lifting, we always want to think about moving. It's not just about the picking up, but it's about getting something from point A to point B. So are there different ways to do that? And there really are. Uh, of course, it depends on the work and what needs to be moved, but, but, but know that there can be solutions. Uh, a compact lifting device uh, can also be used. This is a device uh, shown on this screen that uh, usually has a platform and um, can be used to uh, move the item, lift it, push it, pull it, that kind of thing. So lots of different options to consider for many different types of, of limitations and work-related barriers that could come into play. Finally, I'll just mention reassignment. Uh, of course, there are going to be situations where somebody maybe cannot be uh, effectively accommodated in their current position. And for that reason, it's always important to look to reassignment as a possible form of accommodation. So in the event that that's the case, it means looking to other vacant positions, first at an equivalent level, uh, that the individual may be qualified to perform. 
Additional accommodations might also be needed, but allowing that person to move into a vacant position allows them to maintain employment, uh, allows you to keep somebody who uh, can, can perform the job duties uh, and can really be a, 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 you know, a sort of a last step or a last resort accommodation solution when it's necessary. Uh, we do have some more information on reassignment on the JN website, so certainly go uh, to that through the topic section of the A to Z. All right, and so I'll end with some resources and then we might have time for one question, maybe two questions. Um, Jan offers a lot of resources on long COVID around uh, accommodation solutions, around the ADA, around supporting employees with long COVID, that guide that we, uh, we partnered with EARN to provide as well. And then of course, I still mentioned that executive functioning deficits resource because I think it's, it comes in really handy in a lot of these scenarios. So take, take advantage of the resources. They're there, they're available to you. And um, I think you'll find them very helpful. So with that, um, I think I might be able to throw a, a question or two out there. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but um, I, do, I am a little bit curious about, and, and this goes to anyone. So when we're thinking about the effects of long COVID and how employers are managing it, uh, have we noticed, is, is there any anecdotal information or otherwise that uh, shows that smaller employers or larger employers are handling things differently or any differences that we can report as it relates to different types of employers? I'm wondering if anything came about through the, the, uh, the think tank or, or any of the round tables. The, the only thing that I would that I would mention is that, you know, generally speaking, larger employers seem to have more resources available to them than a the smaller employer. So that seems to be the biggest difference in how the small versus the large employer might be um, dealing with this issue. And that's not uncommon for any type of accommodation or, or in any in any in any area. But generally speaking, this the same the, the ch big challenges that are presenting themselves um, are agnostic as it relates to the size of the employer. That's very helpful. Thank you, Brian. Right. Uh, also with the think tank, I know that it was mentioned that um, it was sort of the first examination of these issues and how employers are managing long COVID. Is there an expectation that the think tank will continue or there will be a, a, a new, a next version of uh, the white paper? Well, the, the think tank is has completed its work <laughs> um, on this issue, and um, we'll certainly look at whether we can update the white paper with new information, and whether that means you know um, bringing another group of um, individuals together. But the work that that think tank did is, is done. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, and then also. Um... Uh, Suzanne, of course, we covered a wide array of practices to effectively accommodate an organization's employees with long COVID. Um, what would you recommend might be one place for an organization to start? You know, <clears throat> I think tap your workforce. Um, I think um, many, many people are impacted by this or have family members who are. And I think showing the employer, both showing goodwill, but also getting a litmus of its own workforce is critically important. So whether you use your um, EAP or you use your employee resource groups, uh, or you create a forum where people can come and say, how is this impacting you? How can we as an employer do better, but get a collective voice? I think just uh, doing it is a sign of goodwill and will engender a sense of optimism in individuals in terms of being able to, it be okay that they're being impacted and they can come forward and get an accommodation. But you'll also get some real good input, I think, about how to create a workforce that's inclusive for this new condition that we're experiencing. Okay. So I'd start. Great information. All right. Well, we just have a few minutes to wrap up. So that's really all the time we have today. Uh, to our collaborators from DMEC, Cedric and Ern, it's really been a pleasure working with you. Uh, thank you, Terry and Brian and Suzanne for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. We really appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. To everyone who joined us, thank you for attending what you should know about the impact of long COVID in the workplace. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to register for the next Jan webcast, Accommodation Solutions for Neurodivergent Workers. Uh, this will be on Thursday, April 13th from uh, 2 to 3 Eastern time. Go to the Jan training, training page at askjan.org to register. If you're seeking a continuing education unit for this training, we do offer one credit through HRCI. Uh, to receive the credit, uh, all you need to do is please complete that webcast evaluation uh, because uh, you will get that CEU code afterwards. Uh, we do appreciate your feedback as it helps us plan for future webcast events, so that evaluation is important. Uh, don't close that Jan webcast window when the webcast ends. The evaluation will pop up in a new window. Uh, once the evaluation is completed, you'll click on that view your certificate of completion. Uh, or you can go to askjan.org slash evaluation reg.cfm. Lastly, thank you to Alternative Communication Services for providing sign language interpreting and captioning services for this webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. This concludes today's webcast.